Welcome, everybody, uh, physically or virtually, to the Center for Global Development. Uh, my name is Justin Zandiver. I'm a senior fellow here in our DC office at CGD. Um, and I'm really uh, excited to be hosting this conversation about India's development progress. Um, let me give just one or two minutes uh, by way of introduction and introduce our speakers before I, I'm going to hand it over to them for our kind of double header seminar here. And we're hoping for, I mean, the topics have been picked um, and the people have been picked uh, to foster you know, a real conversation here. Um, and I'm really interested to see how these things interact. Um, so we're going to have uh, Sabina Alkair, who is professor uh, at Oxford University uh, and director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development uh, Initiative, OFI. Um, Sabina is sort of the mastermind of the Multidimensional Poverty Index, um, which has been kind of conducted around the world. Um, and most notably, and I think the motivation for, for us hosting uh, Sabina here virtually today um, is uh, just 10 days ago, uh, the UNDP and OFI launched the uh, 2022 Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, um, which is, as the name implies, uh, global, but I think had some really interesting headline results uh, for India about, you know, kind of startling levels of poverty reduction in terms of multidimensional poverty in India over 15 years. Um, and so Sabina is going to tell us all about that in a few moments. Um, and then sitting next to me, um, Arvind Subramanian is a distinguished non-resident fellow here at the Center for Global Development, uh, also a senior fellow at the Watson Institute at Brown University, and from 2014 to 2018, was the chief economic advisor to the government of India. Um, so how do these things um, fit together? You know, we've been here at the center kind of monitoring the, the news about uh, India's poverty trends, um, what I've been calling the great Indian poverty debate 2.0, um, what has happened to India's poverty um, during Modi's government. Um, and it's really hard to assess um, because of the kind of state of the statistical infrastructure in India. Um, Arvind has famously, you know, raised questions about the accuracy of the GDP growth numbers. Um, we're lacking recent NSS consumption survey numbers. Um, and so even if you don't have a philosophical motivation for wanting sort of non-monetary and multidimensional poverty, um, it's really hard to come by good monetary measures of poverty in India right now, um, which uh, leads us into um, Sabina's hands and, you know, multidimensional measures which rely on other things like housing and nutrition and other things that are non-money metric. Um, and that dovetails, I think, quite nicely with, you know, this term that Arvind has coined, the new welfareism, which has been a real focus of, of this government of distributing private goods like and services like access to bank accounts, sanitation, housing, cooking, gas, and so on. Um, and so I think the data that Sabina is going to present give us a chance to kind of evaluate this new welfareism. How has India done, not on the monetary poverty dimensions, but on improving poor people's access um, to all these, others, all these other dimensions of welfare. Um, so Sabina is going to kick off um, for about 20 minutes and give us you know, the big numbers. And then we're going to turn over to Arvind um, to give his kind of take on the state of the Indian economy and development progress. Uh, and then we'll open it up uh, to everybody here and online um, for Q&A. So with no further ado, Sabina, um, I think if you want to put up your slides. Um, the floor is yours. And if I can remind you, while you do that, everybody in the room, if you want to talk, um, you need to use your mic in front of you. And if you're online and you want to raise a question, please go ahead and use the raised hand function. All right, Sabina, please. Thank you so much. It's, it's really good to be here. And I really look forward to the exchange, to listening to Arvind, to thinking about um, other things than just measurement. But what I would like to do primarily is unpack, as Justin said, some of the new findings on the levels and the trends of poverty using the 19 to 21 NFHS 5 or DHS survey. And the headline figure um, that we put out in a report joint with UNDP on October 17th was that in a 15 year period from 2005, six to 2019, 21, 415 million people left poverty. So the multidimensional poverty index <clears throat> fell from 0.283 to 0.069. And the headcount ratio or incidence of people who are multidimensionally poor fell from 55.1 to 16.4. Um, the first period spanned 10 years 
and the last period spans about four and a half. So they are not equal in terms of length. So what I'd like to do is put that first onto the international stage and then unpack the trends in poverty by different groups within India, and then look a little bit at the 19 to 21 data, um, the state of poverty in the most recent survey that still does not represent the post COVID reality. And um, end with a little bit on the composition of poverty, some handles for action perhaps. So for those who are not uh, into this work, um, in terms of multidimensional poverty, as Justin said, we're looking at a measure which directly assesses a person as um, condition in 10 indicators, uh, weighted equally in three dimensions, health, education, and living standard, and covering 10 indicators weighted equally within each dimension. For example, you are undernourished, you are deprived in nutrition if any member of your household is undernourished, I, uh, underweight for adults or underweight or stunted for children or if a child is not attending school up to the age at which they would complete class eight, or if they lack uh, basic sanitation, basic drinking water services, uh, if their house has rudimentary floor, wall, or roofing. So um, based on their particular deprivation profile across these 10 indicators, each person obtains a deprivation score. And if they're deprived in one third or more of the indicators, they're identified as poor. And the technology, which was co-developed with James Foster, has the incidence of the, or the percentage of people who are identified as poor being adjusted by intensity, which is the average deprivation score among the poor, to create the multidimensional poverty index, which is useful in particular because it covers um, deprivations among the poor. And if any one deprivation of a person who is poor is reduced, even if that person remains poor, then poverty goes down. And it's also convenient because you can break it down by indicator, as we'll see. So what does this finding look like if we look across 111 countries and 6.1 billion people, which is what we cover in this year's report? We updated 12 countries, six in Latin America, and of course, including India, and now include uh, Argentina, Samoa, and Tuvalu. Um, in terms of date, like in the case of India, some surveys are old. So we have a window of potential surveys from 2010 to 2021. 81% of poor people have data fielded in 2016 or later, and 37 have data, 37% of poor people have data fielded in 2019 or later. So of those 6.1 billion people, 1.2 billion are poor, deprived in one third or more of the weighted indicators. And a finding we've had a number of years now running, sadly, is that half of those people are children. One in three children are poor, but one in seven adults. This year, for the first time, um, there are more poor people in Sub-Saharan Africa, significantly more than in South Asia, primarily because of strong reduction in MPI in South Asia, and also because the data in Sub-Saharan Africa population weighted are two and a half years older. So there might be progress we cannot yet see. In terms of distribution globally, 83% of the poor live in rural areas. And in terms of trends, we cover 81 countries, over 5 billion people, and 72 of those countries had statistically significant reductions in at least one period we studied. Um, of the 20 fastest countries to reduce it, 12 were in Africa. And the earlier period of reduction in India is among the 20 fastest but not the most recent period, which in absolute terms is a bit slower. There's also a problem for children in that of the 81 countries, half, 40, had a situation in which either children had zero reduction of their poverty or they reduced poverty, but more slowly than adults and they are poorer than adults. Now, sadly, all of these data do not represent the post pandemic situation. And in 2020, our simulations had suggested that the pandemic will have incremented uh, or set poverty reduction back by three to 10 years. And using more updated data, now we can confirm that it's likely at the high end of those simulations. So what I'd like to do now is turn towards that finding from India and, and probe it a bit more. 
first of all, um, just on the, the implications it has for other countries, you will know that goal one of the sustainable development goals is to end poverty and target 1.2 of 69, 169 targets is to cut by half multidimensional poverty. Um, and so this finding where you saw within 15 years of a cut by well more than a half um, shows that this is possible and at scale. And so that has a significant, um, generates significant interest outside India as well as within. Furthermore, of the 10 indicators in the global MPI, all 10 significantly reduced in both periods. In the most recent period, the progress was highest in sanitation, cooking fuel and housing. We identify a group of people who are severe poor because they're deprived in at least half of the dimensions. And that likewise fell from 27.8 to 4.2% of the population. We also identify a group who are just barely non-poor. Their deprivations are between 20 and 33%. That didn't go up, but it went from 17% in 2005, six to 18.7 in 2019-21 and significantly in the most recent period, two thirds of the vulnerable are deprived in nutrition. But let's now take this apart and look a little bit more closely at those trends. In the first decade, we had seen that the poorest groups had the fastest absolute reduction of poverty and the poorest groups were children, they were rural areas, they were states, they were the scheduled castes and particularly scheduled tribes, and they were the Muslim groups. In the most recent period, we also find that the poorest groups had the strongest reduction. So this graphic from the report um, shows the level of multidimensional poverty in 2015-16 on the horizontal axis with the poorest state Bihar on the right-hand side. And it shows the rate of absolute reduction vertically with the fastest reduction towards the bottom. Uh, so you see that overall across straight states, there's a broadly poor, pro-poor absolute reduction. Just put that into some kind of intuition. In Bihar, incidence was 77% in 2005, six, falling to 52 in 15, 15, and 35% in 2019, 21. In Jharkhand, from 75% to 31%. In Madhya Pradesh, from 69% to 24%, and Uttar Pradesh, from 69% to 23%. So these are quite strong uh, reductions in some of the, the poorer states. But of course, we also want to know what happened in relative terms. In relative terms, you're covering what proportion of the distance to zero poverty was covered in this most recent period. And Goa covered the most, followed by Jammu, Jammu Kashmir, Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and Rajasthan. It tends to be easier for the less poor regions to reduce poverty um, re in relative terms and the poorest to reduce poverty in absolute terms. And I'll come back to this. If we take a step back and just look across rural and urban areas, we find that both of them had statistically significant decreases in incidence, intensity, multidimensional poverty, and se severe poverty in both periods. Rural areas had significant increases in vulnerability um, in both periods, and in urban, it decreased in the most recent. The number of poor people decreased, um, obviously higher uh, in, in the rural areas from 557 million in 2005, six to 207. And in rural areas, it fell um, to 24 million. And the population shares between rural and urban areas are always difficult. They were relatively stable um, with smaller fluctuations. And if you look at the indicators across the rural and urban, as I said, all 10 had significant reductions in both regions and in both periods with the biggest absolute reductions in cooking fuel and sanitation in both regions. But after that, the patterns diverge somewhat, but are, are positive throughout. Um, there is a question about how to measure the sustainable development goal idea of leaving no one behind. So I just put some different thoughts out there. 
um, were rural areas leaving no one behind. So far, I have favored looking at absolute trends. And in absolute trends, as you saw, they had a faster reduction of 0.019 annualized in the first period and 0.016 <laughs> annualized in the second, much faster than the urban. Um, but in relative terms, as I explained, which is easier to do in less poor areas, urban regions had a faster relative reduction with the fastest in the most recent period. Another option is to look at where the higher percentage of poor people live. And here there is a finding which is important both for India but also internationally. Recall I said that 83% on average of poor people globally were in rural areas. In India, it was 86% in 2005, six, rising to 90% in the most recent period. So that's really quite a high ongoing rural burden of poverty. Another interesting cut is children. Remember that um, we said that children made up 50% of the global poor. And furthermore, that they often were not reducing poverty um, as fast as adults. So we break this into different cohorts, but I'll focus on children by who I mean people zero to 17 and adults aged 18 and above. And both of those groups plus the different four cohorts had statistically significant decreases in incidence, intensity, MPI, and severe poverty in both periods. Children had significant increases in both periods. And in adults, it decreased in the latest period. So the number of poor children um, fell by 190 million people in 15 years. So of those 415 million, 199 were children, 215 were adults, a bit of rounding error for simplicity. But also note the population shares changed quite a bit. 40% of the population were children in 2005-06 and 32% in the most recent survey. Again, for children, all of the indicators had statistically significant reductions across both age groups in both periods. And again, as, as is the case across India, the um, sanitation and cooking fuel had strong increases. But in children, um, there was a, a visibly strong increase, de decrease in nutrition as well, um, particularly in the first period. And again, in terms of children, it's interesting because in absolute terms, children had a faster reduction than adults, but not in relative terms. But also in terms of the percentage of poor children, it decreased. The global percentage is 50%, but in 2005-06, it was 46%. And in 2019-21, it was 42%. So take a your picture of these measures, but in terms of leaving no one behind, um, it's, an, it's an interesting discussion uh, to consider. So what are the ongoing challenges and what is the shape of poverty in a sense in the 2019 to 2021 data set, the NFHS 5? 16.4% of people are poor and on average, they're deprived in 42% of the di dimensions. So it's a, it's a burden of 229 million people. The next country that has the highest number of people is Ethiopia with 97 million. In terms of how they are poor, deprivations in cooking, fuel, housing, and nutrition are the strongest. Um, and so that those remain strong challenges, even though, as we will see, there were, there were all already strong reductions in those topics. Um, and in terms of states, um, you'll see that, yes, um, there are the, the predictable Bimari you know, regions but we already saw that there were strong reductions, but still of the 10 poorest states in 2015, 16, nine of them are poorest in 2019, 21. West Bengal no longer is among the poorest 10. Another challenge is that um, if you look at female headed households in India, um, rather distinctively, they are poorer than male headed households. And that's not the case in any other country in South Asia. And so it might be something to consider though who is a female headed household varies greatly across countries in the region as well as internationally. So it's not, it's a very, very messy category, but we, we report that for every country, just in a sense to, to explore what's possible. 
perhaps in terms of policy, what can also be interesting is to look at how people are deprived in the most recent period still with the large red stripes being nutrition, the lighter ones um, and the darker ones being the years of schooling and the school attendance and the blue indicators of um, cooking fuel, the lightest blue is a little bit smaller because this reflects the weights on the indicators and the higher weights on education and health. These are ranked from Bihar, the poorest state, to Kerala, the least poor. Um, and you'll see that although there are differences across them, um, there's also quite a lot of similarities, particularly in the nutrition uh, aspects. Um, and we can then break this down. I won't take much time on these, but you can look at all of these findings as you would imagine in rural and urban areas. Um, and in rural areas, one in four residents experience severe poverty, which is, I think, a worry in finding. Um, and for children, again, um, it's one in three children experience severe poverty. So these are, these are really signaling out that some of the poorer regions also have a depth of deprivation, uh, intensity of deprivation, which is worth uh, considering going forward. Um, we also look, of course, at people aged 16 and above, and they are a little bit poorer than adults. Adults aged 18 to 16, 60, 13.6% 16, are poor, and it's 15.7% of older adults. So just a couple minutes closing on the new um, theme of our report with UNDP this year, which is on deprivation bundles and deprivation profiles. I also already introduced a deprivation profile as showing which of the 10 indicators a person is deprived in. A deprivation bundle is some combination of indicators that may not be all that they are deprived in. And we focused on both of them. So for example, in this chart, we see that 3.9% of all poor people, so 1.2 billion people, poor people, are deprived in nutrition um, and sanitation and housing and cooking fuel, those four indicators only. And we see that 3.5 of the global poor are deprived in every standard of living indicator. A deprivation bundle is a subset. And so uh, we can look, for example, at water and sanitation, and we find that 437 million people have those two deprivations, 330 million in sub-Saharan Africa, only 45 million in South Asia, interesting for policy of WASH. We can also find out that 593 million people are both deprived in electricity and cooking fuel, an important thing for clean energy, but not so relevant in South Asia. This is the situation for India. It's quite different, but 15% of the poor people in India experience the most common deprivation bundle of nutrition, cooking fuel, sanitation, and housing. Altogether, there are 652 different deprivation profiles among the poor people in India. Um, but these 17 here pictured cover half of the poor. And so it can be quite interesting to have very laser sharp policy recommendations looking exactly at the deprivation bundles and the deprivation profiles that they experience. I won't say more about that now. Just closing geek remarks. When I speak, for example, of um, the annualized rate of change we have robustified this for different definitions of annualized for across the three waves of India. When there's the 415 million people leaving poverty, we've also robustified it for different population years. And in both cases, we are presenting the lower bound of the figures. We also examined carefully the COVID um, dates of each of the household surveys across states and the months and the timings. But we can confirm what others have already published which is it doesn't seem that we can do much to explore post-COVID situations. So this just leaves me to the final point, which is that um, globally, we observe the data from 2010 to 2021. And globally, three of our poorest countries are home to 50 million poor people, but their data come from 2010 or 2012. And so clearly there's a call for the data revolution not to leave poverty data behind. But in the context of India, with the problems in obtaining consumption data that Justin referred to, but also with the problem that these data do not reflect the post-pandemic situation. There's also a real need to think forward about how not to leave poverty data behind, 
but have poverty data that can be a tool for managing further decreases going forward. Thank you so much. All that I've presented is online, um, fully available. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Sabina, and excellent time management. Um, so beyond the headlines, we got kind of a tour there of both where um, poverty reduction is happening in India and, and this kind of new focus around these bundles of, of deprivation. Um, and I want to come back later in the Q&A around this bundle around nutrition, fuel, sanitation, and housing, um, and explore that a little bit more. But that was a great tour of the, of the horizon there. Um, let's go, before we open it up, directly to, uh, to Arvind, um, who also has slides. Um, he's going to share. And are those coming from... <clears throat> what did we settle on, Maimuna? Is he doing it? Or are you? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. There we go. All right. Um, Arvind, the floor is yours to be equally disciplined as Sabina was. Okay. Uh, 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 thanks, Justin. Uh, and thanks, uh, Sabina, for a, a really terrific presentation uh, on, on this multidimensional poverty index. Uh, um, um, maybe, you know, uh, the, the title for my talk, India's Flavor du Jour, uh, maybe Sabina and your report is responsible in part for that, uh, for making India the flavor sure. But uh, I, I'm going to try and uh, touch upon some of the other aspects uh, to complement uh, your excellent presentation. Um, but to ask, you know, uh, is this uh, why is this happening? Why is India all the rage, and and is that warranted? Uh, uh, you know, uh, clearly India seems to be the rage. Uh, the Economist a few months ago called this India's moment. Uh, Michael Spence thinks that India, and among many others, Larry Summers, Michael Spence, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, you know, you talk to um, uh, anyone on 19th Street in Washington, and, and uh, if you ask them for the one bright spot in the global economy, um, um, even if they're not sober, they would probably say India. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, uh, most uh, uh, dramatically, uh, Apple has said that it's uh, not said it's started a production of uh, the iPhone 14. Uh, so they plan to begin with 5% of global sales in India uh, and, you know, maybe increase that over time steadily. Uh, so it's kind of a, a dramatic thing. Um, you know, Apple in India is referred to as the fruit company uh, for those who, who uh, follow these things. So, so India is kind of uh, uh, all the rage. Uh, so the question I uh, want to ask is why and, you know, is it warranted? I think it's uh, it, it's in the news for a number of reasons. There's some headline popping numbers like, you know, India's latest growth rate was 13 and a half percent. And, you know, uh, in this post uh, Ukraine, post uh, uh, world where everyone is suffering from low growth, this you know number has a kind of a particular salience. Uh, and then in kind of uh, uh, what might be called, you know, a kind of inversion of colonial schadenfreude, you know, India overtakes uh, UK uh, with an Indian origin prime minister now occupying 10 Downing Street. You know, this is India's also the rage uh, because of that. Um, I think there's a huge relative dimension to what's going on. Uh, there's kind of macro instability in South Asia. Sri Lanka, as we know, uh, has had, you know, terrible uh, social and political breakdown uh, because of uh, an economic crisis. Um, Pakistan has been ravaged by climate and also politically unstable. And, you know, uh, 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 even a few months ago, uh, Bangladesh was the darling of the development world. Uh, lots of, uh, you know, Bengali schadenfreude against India. You know, see, we've overtaken India. Uh, but of course, Bangladesh has now gone to the fund uh, to borrow money as well. So, so India kind of stands out. You know, Adam Tooze has this phrase called the South Asian poly crisis. And India seems to be an exception to this South Asian poly crisis. Of course, on the relative dimension, India is looking better and better uh, the more she, you know, behaves true to form. And with, you know, China spiraling, spiraling downward on so many counts, uh, India is starting to look better with its young population, its stability, and its kind of talented workforce. I, I think uh, India is also in the news because... Uh, uh, clearly, opportunities are opening up for India. China has been vacating space. You know, um, globalization shocks, even though they're negative, they're favoring services in which India has an advantage over manufacturing. And of course, post-Ukraine capital is seeking to exit 
quote unquote odious regimes like China and Russia, and, and India stands out uh, amongst others, Vietnam, Bangladesh, as a potential destination for all this capital that's going to, you know, seek, uh, you know, to, uh, to go to destinations that's kind of one of us, quote unquote. Um, and the Apple, I mean, I suspect this Apple decision could not have happened without the China dimension, uh, uh, given the underlying investment climate in India. So that clearly, uh, geopolitics is also working in India's favor. And then I think we come to what are real hardware achievements in India. I think uh, something that's been under noticed is that since the late 1990s, uh, uh, the capacity of the Indian state to deliver at scale has really been improving remarkably. Uh, I, I think uh, we had a, we had an infrastructure boom from the 1990s. First, it was public led, then it was private led. Now it's back to being public led, uh, uh, and but still overall infrastructure uh, booming, ra roads, railroads, metros, and so on. Uh, then, uh, you know, beginning in the 2000s, you know, the old Congress government, I, I think, really put in place uh, the beginnings of a real India-wide social safety net. Uh, you had the employment guarantee scheme, you had the food security scheme, you had various right to education and these acts. Aadhaar, people forget, uh, the biometric identification was begun under the UPA. So, so, so the beginnings of a real social safety net, which actually stood India in great stead during the uh, COVID pandemic, was actually begun there. And then I think this is where I think uh, Sabina's presentation is uh, is very relevant and very important. Uh, what I call, uh, you know, the Modi style uh, kind of uh, new welfareism. I mean, in the 70s, we'd have called this the basic needs approach. Uh, you know, it's the public provision of essential private goods and services, harnessing technology that JAM is, you know, uh, the, the three trinity of the biometric banks and mobile technology being harnessed together uh, and, and uh, delivering this. Uh, I, this is very, it's also very politically uh, astute uh, because uh, what's distinctive about this new welfareism is that it involves the delivery of attributable tangibles, you know, stuff that people know that they're getting and they know who is giving it to them. And that's what makes this both, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, objective basic needs uh, very important, but also politically, electorally, it's kind of a, a big uh, success as well. Uh, so uh, attributable tangibles is, is what I, I, I would call the new welfareism. And then, of course, India, which is now, I'm going to show you a chart on this. The, the, there's a kind of, uh, uh, the state has provided, a, in fact, digital public infrastructure in the form of this unified payments interface and it's uh, causing a, it's leading to a real digital and fintech revolution uh, uh, in in certain uh, spaces in india I, I just want to, you know, I'm not going to show because Sabina has showed uh, much of this new welfareism, social safety net we know about, infrastructure. I, I just, you know, uh, partly out of just a, a bit eccentricity, I want to show this. You know, on the left hand side, you see the number of unicorns that India has created, uh, 300 and uh, about 100 plus valued at about 350 to 400 billion. I think it's the second or the third largest in the world. It's really a very, very dynamic entrepreneurial space, but based on cheap finance, uh, talent, uh, and this new digital revolution that's been unleashed in India. Uh, and it's creating, uh, and the applications of this are, you know, across the economy. Um, uh, so th this is a pocket of entrepreneurial dynam dynamism in India, but it's not very employment intensive because of fairly skill intensive activities. My favorite illustration, I, I often say that I've become an obsessive chess follower of Indian chess. India is creating as many chess grandmasters as unicorns, uh, with the difference that creating chess masters doesn't depend upon Jay Powell's uh, interest rate policies. Even if finance dries up, we will still create chess grandmasters. And, you know, India is creating chess grandmasters at a faster pace than, uh, you know, uh, all the traditional powerhouses, Russia, Soviet Union, China, you say. And I don't think this would have been possible without the digital revolution uh, in India. Is this optimism warranted? Um, I just want to focus on recent performance. Um, 
we had this massive boom uh, in the two early 2000s. It was a boom worldwide, but India was the fastest growing economy in the world. You see the black bars, you know, every macro indicator, real terms, annual average growth rate, double digit, 15, 16, high double digits as well. Uh, after 2011, when the measurement changes, uh, uh, you know, uh, the collapse happens not because of the measurement changes. You know, the collapse happens. Everything, you know, uh, declines substantially. Uh, uh, the measurement comes in because if you look at the GDP de growth data for the same two periods that I'm showing in the chart, it will show G GDP growth basically unchanged flat. Uh, I, I, and that underlies my concerns about uh, the GDP data. But basically, uh, after 20, after the global financial crisis, India slows down considerably. Oh, even before COVID, we have a major financial shock in 2019-20. The economy collapses, and then COVID comes and hits India. And, and some of the excitement about these big numbers, I think we have to be really careful, because if you look at the recovery and kind of benchmark it to pre-COVID, the red line is GDP. Uh, basically, the economy has grown 4% over nine quarters, which is really very, very feeble recovery. And this despite the fact that India has had a massive uh, export boom uh, and, um, uh, 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 you know, people here like, you know, Sutita Roy here, they've examined this uh, uh, much better. You know, the labor market in India is very weak. The employment population ratio has been in secular de decline. That's my favorite measure of labor market performance in India. Uh, you know, on the right-hand side, you see a demand for this employment guarantee scheme, which even after the recovery is still pretty high. Um, and then while all this has been going on, when I presented this a year ago, I would have kind of stopped here. But of course, uh, the big macro challenges have returned to India. For about three years, inflation has been above uh, the central bank's target of 4%. And for more than 60% of the time, it's been above the ceiling uh, target for the central bank above 6% as well. So uh, inflation has returned. And something that I hadn't realized until very recently, that India has a very unique fiscal challenge. Now, uh, I could India has double digit deficits, uh, very high in the world. Uh, but you know, maybe comparable to some emerging market countries. But what really gives you a sense of the fiscal kind of uh, vulnerability of India is there is how much interest payments, either uh, the share of revenue you see on the left hand side, interest as a share of revenue in India is more than forty percent. Even Brazil, which is kind of amongst the most you know serially fiscally pro profligate Latin American country, the interest revenue ratio is only twenty percent. And if you look at it as share of expenditure, India's interest payments, you know, take up over 20 percent of expenditure. So uh, 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 it, it's something that people don't realize that, you know, although India has not had really fiscal crises apart from what happened in 1991, there's this perennial, uh, 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 you know, fiscal kind of it's uh, it's never led to crisis, but really it manifests in terms of how little uh, how vulnerable it is on the revenue side, you know, sh to shocks, and how much you know interest just eats up and crowds out uh, 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 development expenditure. And this is actually very special and unique, uh, even amongst most emerging market countries. Uh, the same challenges uh, I think confront the states, um, uh, and I could carry on about India's fiscal challenges. I think in terms of a, a, a kind of, I want to complement the development side. I think uh, Sabina's highlighted, um, uh, you know, the great progress made on this new welfareism. But I think we just need to keep that in context. Um, this is a chart, uh, you know, the broader educational transformation. It's a, a lovely paper by Justin, which shows on the left-hand side, unconditional literacy, which has risen. But if you look at learning uh, in Indian schools, uh, you will see that there's been, you know, conditional on being in grade five, how much you learn actually has declined very sharply. And it's consistent with, you know, 
Pratham uh, uh, data for the last 15 years, learning uh, outcomes are poor and stagnating. And, and so the educational transformation broadly has been very disappointing uh, in India. And you can see India is uh, South Asia is an outlier on Justin's chart on the right hand side, declining very sharply, uh, others uh, less so. Um, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, this is uh, one of my favorite charts. It's the, you know, the India's failed uh, employment transformation. Um, this, what this chart is showing on the y-axis is what is India's share of the global global low-skill exports, and on the x-axis, India's share of working age population, and the whole sample is restricted to non-advanced economies. So a rough trade intuition is that, you know, the more unskilled pay people you should have, uh, commensurately you should occupy that share of global labor skilled exports. And you can see that India and China are just massive outliers on, you know, in opposite directions. India has about 22% of the working age population uh, amongst all developing countries, but 4% of, uh, of global exports. China has, you know, similar share of working age population and 40%. So in a sense, this is the cumulative a failure of the Indian employment and structural transformation, which manifests itself uh, uh, in poor employment opportunities. And of course, there's the, you know, the failed gender transformation. This is a chart from 2012, India's labor force participation, uh, well below uh, uh, the, uh, the line of best fit. And of course, over time, India's labor force participation has, de female labor force participation has declined. So, so I think when we uh, uh, look at, I mean, uh, uh, you know, digest uh, Sabina's excellent uh, analysis, one has to keep these broader, uh, you know, development transformations in mind uh, uh, when we assess that. Um, yeah, I want to say that, you know, headlines flatter to deceive. We've had a big slowdown. We've had two shocks. We've had feeble recovery, macro challenges, uh, but, you know, opportunities are growing. There's no question that the hardware is improving. Uh, the basic needs come social, social safety net provision, uh, as Sabina has shown, is improving quite a bit. But the growth and employment challenges loom large. And I want to end by you know, focusing on what I find is something interesting that's happening in India, which kind of has, uh, you know, harks back to some of the uh, discussions we've had 20, 30 years ago about development strategy. So to be fair to the government, <coughs> They're confronted with this growth and employment challenge. What do they do? They have a strategy. The strategy is a fourfold strategy. On the external side, um, you know, repudiating a 25, 30 year consensus, tariffs have been raised, and Shomitro Chatterjee and I calculated it affects about 70% of India's imports. Uh, tariffs have gone up about 5 to 6%. So on the external side, the strategy says we're going to re erect barriers, not at the scale we did. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, it's not going to be 80% and 100% tariffs, but you know, uh, uh, 17, 20%. Second, we're not really going to engage in trade arrangements internationally. Now, a bit of this is in flux. Uh, there talks, there's talk about an India-UK free trade agreement, etc. We'll wait and see. But for the moment, India has decided to stay away from the dynamic agreements in Asia, which is RCEP. Uh, so on the external side, it's very much an inward looking strategy. On the internal side, which is really, I think, really, really uh, unique in India and kind of harks back uh, to Korea, Taiwan in terms of, you know, industrial policy and promoting national champions. So what India has done for the first time is just, uh, you know, uh, giving out, uh, you know, fistfuls of subsidies production subsidies to a bunch of sectors, you know, 25, 30, 35 billion dollars, and is at the same time promoting national champions, much like Japan did for the Zaibatsu and Korea did for the Che Balls back in the 60s and 70s. This is completely kind of unique in India. Um, now, what is interesting about this national champion strategy is, of course, that uh, I call this the 2A variant of stigmatized capitalism. The 2A is because the two champions being promoted are, uh, uh, I, I, you know, uh, uh, like Voldemort, they must, ca they cannot be named. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, uh, the two groups uh, which are uh, uh, very, very prominent in India. And the difference between these national champions 
and and the Che balls and even the robber barons of the UK, US, and and the current uh, you know pluto plutocrats of the U, of the US, you know the Bezoses, the the uh, Steve Jobs, the, uh, the the Carnegies, the Vanderbilts, they were all one trick. Maybe in the case of Elon Musk, two trick ponies. Maybe now he's getting a third trick as well. Uh, but these are all you know. But the Indian national champions are octopus-like in their, uh, uh, you know, in the space they occupy in the Indian economy. They're everywhere, you know, uh, and I've probably missed out some sectors that I put up on the list. So that's the one big difference. So in some sense, uh, you know, the relationship between state and capital is kind of pretty, uh, you know, murky uh, in terms of what's going on. The second big difference with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Korea was that these are all mostly in non-tradable Reg government regulated sectors so that in, in the case of Korea, whereas, uh, you know, they were favored, but they were subject to the discipline of having to compete and export successfully in global markets. This is not there for these uh, national champions. So this is a kind of a strategy that is uh, uh, really, uh, you know, uh, my reaction to this is uh, initially skepticism, maybe a little bit of anxiety. But, you know, maybe uh, India can pull this off uh, in a manner that it's never done before or other countries have never really attempted. But in terms of kind of development strategy, it's something quite distinctive, um, a, a bit worrying, but maybe uh, the worries will be allayed over time. And, you know, or, uh, all these national champions will actually turn out to be, you know, uh, efficiency monsters and really bring down uh, productivity, increased productivity and efficiency in the economy. The, the, the prima facie evidence, you know, doesn't really uh, go in that favor. There are spillovers in terms of how they've actually crowded out investment by competitors. Uh, so I think this is a space uh, to be watched as well. Uh, finally, uh, of course, uh, you know, the government is responding with a strategy, but it's also responding uh, with, with a kind of broader disposition or affect. What is the government's disposition? This is what I call the missing, what Josh Feldman and I call the missing software of economic policy making. You know, all the things that we would like a level playing field for all investors, not just for a few, you know, non-arbitrary inclusive decision making, which of course, uh, there have been several violations of that during the pandemic. In the case of the farm laws, uh, uh, I think uh, it was fairly centralized and arbitrary. Uh, we want policy stability, uh, but if you look at agriculture or the tax regime or the bankruptcy code, uh, 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 policy has been far from stable. Then there's the whole data integrity and transparency that we speak about, <clears throat> GDP numbers, poverty numbers, COVID numbers, kind of uh, still a, a work in progress at best. And of course, crucially, the elephant in the room, um, social and political harmony obviously matter for themselves. But, you know, in the long run, they're also critical to any uh, software of economic policy making. So, so I think um, uh, to, to sum up, um, uh, uh, you know, big improvements in hardware, physical, digital, you, you know, the social safety net, basic welfare uh, thing, but the broader dynamism, employment opportunities, uh, education, gender, and of course, you know, environment looming large. And, and at least for the growth and employment challenge, not obvious that either the government's strategy, specific strategy, or its broader, you know, uh, uh, the ability to kind of do good economic policy making, uh, that too is kind of a little bit up in the air. So, so uh, I, I come away with the sense of, you know, is this flavor du jour warranted? My disposition and mood is again more one of uh, skepticism, even anxiety, uh, rather than you know any sense of euphoria. Thanks, Justin. All right. Wow. Um, okay, a lot to digest there. On time. Uh, uh, yep, oh, excellent works on time, excellent. Um, well, I mean, allowing the plus or minus two minute uh, flex there. Um, uh, I wanna, my, my task here, one of my tasks here is to try to, to, try to make uh, Sabina and Arvind uh, talk to each other um, and make these things connect a little bit. Um, so let me first go back to Sabina before we, while well, everybody else can start preparing their questions. But um, 
I'm curious to hear you, Sabina, you talked a little bit, of the bit, bit at the beginning of your presentation about the, the global report that you've just published and the international perspective. I mean, Arvind posed this question of like, is everybody's enthusiasm for India's recent track record justified? Um, I mean, I feel like there's an analogy within India, you pointed out that, you know, the poorest states, Bihar, UP, Madhya Pradesh, also made the most absolute progress. And does that same logic apply to India? I mean, it, it's huge and it was poor at the beginning of your long period. And so you saw a good chunk of poverty reduction. But how do you score in your report India's rate of progress relative to other comparator benchmarks, whichever those might be? Can I add? Could, uh, I have a question. You wanted us to talk to each other. Right? <laughs> Go on, uh, uh, Sabina. I, I have I have a question, um, a, 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 a kind of really genuine doubt um, uh, about uh, you know. I think your analysis is really uh, terrific. My question to you is: Have you had a chance to look at uh, the NFHS five data? And I wanted to get your sense of what you think about that. Because let me just uh, uh, put three factoids on this, which kind of, uh, I would love your reactions to. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, if you look at the stunting data, for example, uh, uh, if you look at the first phase one states, they all showed a deterioration, but all the phase two states showed an improvement. Uh, uh, how does one digest that? I mean, is this, uh, you know, what to think? Second is that there were some real anomalies in the data. For example, uh, I advised the government of Tamil Nadu. And if you look at the sex ratio at birth for Tamil Nadu from 2015 to 2019, uh, it's deteriorated. And Tamil Nadu's sex ratio at birth, you know, you know, you know that Tamil Nadu is in terms of gender, Kerala and Tamil Nadu are up there. Its sex ratio at birth now is apparently worse than Punjab's, which is the you know which is has the worst sex ratio at birth. So that number is a little bit. Uh, and also, if you look at the stunting data, you know it seems like Maharashtra is worse than, uh, for example, Madhya Pradesh and uh, you know Odisha, for example. And I mean, just want to get you to give a sense of, you know, have you looked at this data closely? Uh, 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 do they kind of raise some questions? Uh, you know, should we be uh, a little bit cautious about uh, digesting and interpreting the data? Just your, your thoughts on, the, on that uh, would be very useful as well. Just, just a quick yes, no question, really. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start with the second. Um, in terms of the NFS5 data, um, we've looked at it, and it is a very complicated data set because, as you said, 17 states were fully complete before the pandemic, and then the others have, you know, between 20 some up to 70 some percent of the interviews that were taken post pandemic. And that was a complicated period because of migration, also because of death. Um, and uh, and and how and who uh, was influenced by the by the pandemic cycle, and then also how to do sampling weights when when people may have been shifting around and when it's over a, lo a longer period of time. So it's it's a complicated data set, which is why it would be lovely if another one came out very quickly, um, so that we could really get a bead on it. Um, so I'm sort of a user of the data um, insofar as I can. I've read the the studies, the criticisms that have come out of that, um, and we've looked state by state, we sort of understand at least what we can about when the survey was fielded um, and the differences in, in the compositions. Uh, for example, you mentioned of stunting, uh, but I don't, I can't really speak beyond that. What I can say is that coming from the demographic and health survey, um, and because we use them for over 40 countries, mixed for 54 countries, these tend to be very good, high quality data. And with sort of guarantees about their quality that come from ICFI in, in DC. And, and that, that's sort of an interesting guarantee. And I don't know if that's going to be the case going forward. Um, but I think basically trying to think about data quality is, is a fundamental part. And we've been able with the NFHS survey so far to just sort of take them at face value and, and look at the survey reports and the academic literature. And I hope that would be the case going forward, but I don't know. So that is 
that, that, that's a bit of a, a, a question mark. Um, but I, I know it might, may sound waffling, but um, all I can do is mm -hmm. when, I, when there are data, we compute and we say what we find. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, um, let's see, I'm trying to remember the summary of your question, Justin. Um, just, just you know, how how do you score India in relative terms on the on the trends? Yeah. So we cover this year 121 country periods. So it's 81 countries, but in a number of them we have three, or in the case of Gam um, Gambia, four periods. And India is among the top 20. It's 17 out of the 20 fastest. So the top fastest this year, Leon. Um, and then in, 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 in the Ebola period, actually 2013 to 2017. Um, and then the India 2005, 6 to 2015, 16 and 17. And the India 2015, 16 to 19 to 21 is 33 out of 121. But these are countries of such different sizes um, and, and shapes that it's, but they are annualized insofar as, and I explained the annualization of India um, is the lower bound, but it's the, it's the same rule that we apply to all countries for comparability precisely. Um, so in that sense, we, we can sort of say, it's, it's not surprising that the second period is slower in absolute terms because the starting level of poverty was lower. Um, uh, and also obviously it was a, a smaller period, so the annualization makes sense, um, but it, it still was a little bit slower, that little bit slower in, in the second period. Um, so yes, we could also then think of and learn from other countries. I think I'm not euphoric about these findings. I'm curious um, because even if let's say that post-pandemic poverty went up, that maybe some of the policies that made this change maybe are stagnating, I don't know. Um, or as Arvind and, and you Justin have so rightly pointed out, the educational attainments, the learning in schools, these things that our data don't cover are not there and they should be covered, but we don't have data in, in our, our in an FHS 5 to cover them, that, um, that still it would be interesting looking back and on behalf of other countries to find out, well, what did go right? What were the programs that Arvind spoke about? Um, you know, what could we learn about the differentials between states, states that did better with less money um, and or, or what, what role was public expenditure versus other actors in society? So I think that that kind of a retrospective study is really what I feel we can do rigorously. I, I don't know, you, euphorically, if, if this is actually still the case because the data are pre-pandemic, basically. So um, I, I would really like to look at public expenditure and priority social areas to look at um, different schemes at different states and really try to unpack these findings more as a learning. So that's the direction my, my thought. Great. And that, that is really useful to think about. You know, we see big numbers, 415 million people out of poverty, but it, but 17th in terms of trends, it puts it in a slightly different perspective. Um, let me turn to the room here um, and see if anyone's eager and online. Um, you have um, the raise hand function at your disposal. I always struggle. Um, it's it's, uh, I think, control Y if you're on a Mac. I can forget it to work. <laughs> um, uh, questions from the room? Yes, please introduce yourself. Um, yeah. Make sure that is the green light on there. Um, the button at the bottom. There you go. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation and uh, good data that you shared. <clears throat> My name is Sanjay Mistra. I come from India. I'm a visitor in DC. Uh, one comment and one uh, question. Comment is uh, related to post pandemic. Uh, there's been a lot of migration that, labor migration that happened earlier to big cities. They went back to their villages. And there has been uh, a lot of challenges in remote areas that anecdotally we hear of, whether it's related to employment, employment of those people uh, and uh, engagement of those people productively. The question is, uh, do we track employability data? So there are three key vectors. Uh, you shared about the employment part of it, employability, the skill development, and the opportunities. Now, how do they three match up? 
So do we track the employability data? Do we have the data at all? And if not, do you think in future it will be required, at least for good policy making, on developing skill development centers in different parts of the country and providing opportunities in those parts? Because a lot of people have stayed back in their, their parental places and refused to go back to big cities. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a, a a great question. Um, um, I want to be careful only to speak about what I know, and and, and maybe I get uh, uh, you know Sutita here, who probably knows more than I do on on this. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by employability. Uh, 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 I, I don't know whether we keep, you know, individual database of, you know, employability would mean what is your existing skill, you know, where, what have you done, your training, etc. Uh, I'm not sure at all whether we do that or not. Um, uh, the data that I showed on on uh, 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 the demand for the uh, employment guarantee scheme uh, that would seem to suggest that even after the recovery. Uh, the demand for that employment guarantee scheme is high, which shows that in the places where they've returned to, uh, obviously the employment opportunities are not that great. Uh, that's why they've come back on this. But, um, uh, you know, detailed tracking of employability, you know, the government has a number of skill development schemes, you know, um, yeah. central, state, et cetera. But how exactly they do this, uh, you know, I, I, I don't really know. Charles, please. Thanks for two very interesting presentations. Um, Arvind, uh, let me try and uh, channel Danny Roderick. Um, uh, you know, it's all very well that India's below the line and China's above the line on the, the manufacturing stuff, but, you know, China was, China's an old story, it's not going to happen again. Manufacturing demand is going down, it takes higher skilled uh, workers, blah, blah, blah. Um, India can't do that. Um, so do they have any other option apart from trying this new industrial strategy of pushing things through services? Yeah. Um, I, th I think Charles, uh, you know, I've just kind of <laughs> struggled and thought about this. You see, th the dilemma is the following, right? I think that if you go back to first the 1970s and then to the late 80s, uh, people said the same about, uh, you know, uh, global market is limited. If, if developing countries start producing it, terms of trade will decline. And then the new industrial economies uh, came along. Then in the, in the 80s, they said this about again, and then China came along and did that with a vengeance. But now, even if you thought that, you know, going forward, that it's both uh, going to be less dynamic, the demand for this, and it's going to be less skill, unskill intensive than it used to be, there's still a lot of space to be occupied. Um, now, whether can in India can pull it off, given if its history of underperformance on this is an open question. Uh, but I think we have to try because, you know, the numbers involved are big. Because when, when it comes to this alternative of, you know, let's do services, uh, you know, Amrit Amirapu, and we have a CGD working paper. If you look at this service sector by service sector, uh, whatever, what you find is that the high productivity sectors in terms of levels are the ones that have uh, very high skill requirements. Right, uh, and and the ones that are relatively, uh, you know, uh, 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 whatever are low skill requirements are not that productive, you know, and and construction maybe somewhere in between. So so I think you have this classic dilemma of, uh, you know, uh, if you really want to do the transformation and get people into higher productive jobs, then they tend to be relatively more skill intensive, but then. Uh, you know, so people who say do services, do services, I think they have to be honest in saying that if you really mean moving into high productive jobs, they tend to be high skill. But then by definition, unless you really 
dramatically uh, or you know improve the skill uh, thing of the labor force you're going to consign one or two cohorts to you know the current informality so so i, I think we should be under no illusions that you know that kind of let's do services strategy uh, i mean manufacturing had this unique thing of you know it could it, it you know you got the uh, uh, you know you had uh, volume relative relatively less demanding on the skill and then this organic you know productivity rise convergence and all of that uh, so i think to say do services uh, both you know there's a kind of category mistake you know because we think services whatever is and the second more important is that the the really high productive or semi high productive activities are also the very skill intensive activities so there is a kind of uh, um a, a kind of de facto consigning a few cohorts to you know whatever can i ask a quick follow up of the both of them then yeah. um uh you you're saying that the current strategy may not work you've pointed out all sorts of macro sort of problems you know uh, large debt and so on sabina the 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 positive picture you were showing uh, on welfare a fair amount of it is driven by large government expenditure right i mean and 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 subsidies and so on i mean how sustainable is it then if if the macro picture quite possibly is going to get considerably worse and a lot of this progress has been driven by government spending you know is is it going to look worse next time S sabina you want to take that <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, 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 so well, Charles, I, I think that, yeah, th that I think is, um, so, so, so when, um, uh, uh, you know, Raghu and I debated this, uh, this very same question, you know, because um, uh, the question does come up whether, uh, unless you, you, you get the broader growth, you don't get the resources to kind of be able to sustain these things. Because I think people forget that when the uh, uh, India social safety net was created, you know, the, the employment, the food security, right? It was created when Indian growth and revenues was booming. Uh, that's what allowed, uh, you know, the Indian state to say, now we have the resources to embark on this. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, during the pandemic, India had to spend a lot. It's still this year spending a lot because of fertilizer and food and stuff. So at some stage, you will run into a resource constraint. And therefore, there will be limits to new welfareism or any kind of thing. And that's why, you know, the broader growth story is absolutely critical uh, to sustaining this uh, indefinitely. Absolutely. I want to turn that into a question for, for Sabina. It triggered a thought. I mean, is there in the multidimensional poverty literature a concept like the growth elasticity of poverty? Is there a, do you have a sense of whether a country's poverty reduction is good or bad relative to the kind of the macro performance? Yeah, so Maria Machantos uh, and co-authors did one paper. We've done a number of papers on measured growth elasticity, including one with Shumon Sheth on state level GDP figures in India. And to wrap them all up in, in one conclusion, whether it's regression based or whether it's uh, measured growth elasticities, we're not finding a relationship between growth, uh, trying different lags, trying different um, uh, ways of putting the variables together. So it seems to be quite different than the monetary, um, because if you repeat the monetary results, um, then then there's there's really nothing there. Um, so it, it is a question of, of whether there would be other both institutional strength, public expenditures, um, social movements, contributory work from whether it's NGOs or private sector, whether those are also um, ways in. And I think that that's uh, the question of, of analysis. And I think overall, um, it, compared to other countries that did see strong um, investments, that the social expenditures in India are still a little bit on the low side. So it, it might be that um, if you look at Singapore, if you look at um, some of the other countries that have done and sustained uh, a high growth of the human human capabilities uh, over time, that there has been a, a bit of an investment in that 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 isn't wasn't at least for them sustainable and did bear returns. So that that would be something I think to to look into further. But 
in the empirical work, we've done several waves of it and, and haven't been able to find much. Interesting. Yeah, I, I haven't if there's any questions. Yeah, if nobody else, go on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, Samina, I just want to alert you to the fact that, uh, you know, in, in India, there's another uh, global hunger index doing the rounds, uh, which has been lambasted for uh, how shoddy and uh, you know bad and misleading it is, uh, and uh, I just hope that you know there's no kind of brand <laughs> contamination going on here. I just want to make sure that you know you're aware of that. Uh, it, it's called the global. I don't know who's doing this. Some global hunger. They, they purport to use some of the indicators that are there in the NFHS as well, but they do it, you know, very badly, and they produce it on an annual frequency when you don't get the data on annual frequency. But I just wanted to alert you to uh, uh, the fact that uh, there's this, uh, you know, kind of bad competition going on, you know. So. Uh, I, I hope I hope good analysis, you know, uh, 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 displaces bad analysis. But but there is bad analysis out there competing with you. Well, good good to let the audience. Uh, if anybody wasn't making uh, differentiating brands as well, um, I'm sure Sabina is. But uh, um, okay, let me let me read uh, from online. We have a question from Ashdeep Seth who asks. Um, could you speak to how climate change concerns and India's energy and climate action goals play a part in the government strategy? And if how they interface with the internal and external strategy, how does it interact with the country's growth strategy, the low rate of female employment and the feminization of agriculture in rural areas? Uh, I, I can't, you know, that, that, that's, you know, uh, uh, too much to kind of uh, think. But I, I think that, uh, I can uh, address the, the the climate change part of it, right? So, so I think India and the government and the prime minister in particular have set very ambitious uh, uh, renewable energy goals. Very ambitious. Um, they've also announced formally net zero by seven, 2070 or 75. Uh, and um, uh, so the government is very serious about that. And in renewable capacity has increased very sharply, 1.1. Two, it is also actually, and the question is a very good one, is related to the strategy that, uh, you know, the industrial strategy, because the two A's that I spoke about are both uh, 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 they're in <laughs> dirty energy, uh, they're in renewable energy, and they've made big new bets on gr green hydrogen. Uh, so, so the recognition that you know any growth and industrial strategy needs to encompass and actually make uh, green energy integral to that is actually very, 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 uh, that sense is very strong. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, climate change looms quite large, both in government policy and in the attitude of the private sector to this. The problem is that India's power sector uh, is completely, uh, in, in, in you know, the, the numbers I showed you, in very bad shape. Um, uh, so, in some ways, uh, the, what could impede this, you know, growth strategy is in fact uh, uh, how uh, these, uh, you know, because India subsidizes uh, 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 energy, uh, especially power, electricity. I shouldn't say energy; it subsidizes electricity massively. Um, um, uh, uh, so it's basically a massive negative carbon tax in the electricity sector. Um, so, uh, so, so immediately you can see the tension there that if you're, you know, if you have negative uh, you know, subsidization of uh, dirty carbon, but you also on the production side, you want to boost uh, green energy, uh, there's, it's going to kind of clash at some point. Uh, so to make this really uh, successful in the long run, I think India has to address the problems of its electricity and power sector. Uh, and, and unless we do that, uh, I think we're going to uh, kind of run into some of the internal contradictions. Please introduce yourself. And Hi, so my name is Shubhangi. I'm a research assistant at CTD. Um, I had a question about the social security nets and social safety nets that you spoke about. Um, 
you mentioned how India has massive social security nets like the MG Narega scheme and the food security acts and everything else. I just was contrasting that with the massive uh, weight of poverty in the rural areas. So um, I just want to ask what you thought could be very plausible um, revisions in how we are implementing these social security networks and the kind of reach that we have across the rural sector and how we can improve that to reduce this burden that the rural sector is facing? Um, see, first of all, uh, I think uh, the, um, the the employment guarantee scheme is a rural employment guarantee scheme, right? So uh, that social safety net is not there in the urban sector. And part of the reason why, I mean, the migration that happened uh, partly also is because, you know, uh, people went back to their homes, but they also had the comfort of being able to draw upon these schemes. Um, so if anything, the question now in India is one of the policy questions is whether we should extend that rural employment guarantee scheme to to urban. And, you know, Jean Drez has some ideas on, on, <coughs> on doing that. So, so in, in that sense, I think um, th there isn't, I, I don't g get... Um, there's a huge discussion in terms of just improving the rural safety net. I don't think, I think what we have seen after the pandemic is more a sense of whether we should make these things more portable. So, for example, um, uh, if your, uh, you know, the employment guarantee scheme or even your uh, public distribution system is not person specific, is location specific. So if you have a lot of mig uh, you know, migration in India and this kind of stuff happens, then uh, you know, you're stuck because if it's place-specific, people are... So, so I think there is discussion, uh, more discussion about how do you do, you know, address those kinds of things. And then, of course, it's tied into the broader politics of you know, interstate stuff. You know, you know, um, if, uh, uh, if a migrant from one state can then avail himself or herself of benefits in another state, then you get into this question of you know uh, what is the you know state saying you know what is fair what is unfair a bit like all the debates around immigration we've had uh, you know across countries you know uh, people are coming they you know using welfare our welfare you know is that fair etc cetera, etc cetera. so those are the kinds of I think challenges looming when we talk about these uh, uh, safety nets uh, in India Tiger have I missed anything you know, please. So you mentioned about the hardware, which was, and you know, you gave, um, you had a positive feedback about the hardware, and and that's rightly so. You see it in the number of um, transfers that, that the government made during the pandemic. Um, but it's it's also true that the major shock absorber during the pandemic was the agri sector, right? Because the amount of transfers that the government gave was small, even though the reach of the transfers was large. Um, we tracked this till 2021 and we didn't see the agri sector uh, share of employment shifting back to pre-COVID levels, right? Um, so people stayed on in terms of... Stayed on, at least till 2021. So we don't know how sticky that, that transition, reverse structural transformation is going to um, stay on, whether that's going to change. In an environment like that, um, I also noticed the exchange here was about industry and versus services, whereas people are really in, in agriculture. And I don't know if it'll stay, maybe it'll stay. In such an environment, where is, what's the step forward? Like, are this, are this, is this discussion about, you know, services and, and industry reflective of people's choices, where, whereas they are still doing, uh, you know, in agri. So what's, what's the way forward on that? There's one positive step maybe with the, with the GM mustard being cleared, uh, but is there anything else you think of? So that's, a, that's a really uh, a very good point because in a, in a sense, it also, you know, this year we've had uh, a heat wave and the long run shocks to agriculture are, are looming as well with climate change. Uh, and therefore, if agriculture is going to be not just a temporary safety net, but something that's a little bit more semi-permanent. How do you boost agricultural productivity uh, and raise farm incomes is, I think, a, a, a really, really important question. Yeah, very good. It's a very good point. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, without more questions in the queue here, I want to just give the, uh, I'm going to slip one in and give Sabina kind of a final word here. Um, I guess my question is, um, stepping back to this framing that we started off with about, you know, the multidimensional poverty measures and sort of the new welfareism, the fiscal push by by the Indian government. I mean, those things seem to link up very nicely. And I'm wondering if there's other, I guess my question is, if you were omniscient, you know, what else would you be capturing in your index? You know, I, I almost wonder if these things match up too nicely. Like there's a big push on sanitation and sanitation is in your index. And there's a big push on cooking fuel and cooking fuel is in your index. Like, are there things that you worry that you're missing out, you know, they might not be an NFHS, but uh, that you wish you could capture, or or is the index you have uh, the ideal one and not driven by the data constraints? Yeah. No, thank you can answer so that, or you can just have the last comment. word. Yeah, you choose. I do that, I'll just, I'll, just I'll, I'll touch very quickly on the clean energy question and then come back to yours, Justin. Um, just to say that the, the MPI also includes um, electricity and cooking fuel. And if you think society-wide, 33% of people in 2005-06 didn't have electricity, 29% were poor, and now it's 3.3% and 2.1%. So that's been a massive reduction, but it's only access. So touching over to Justin, it's not interruptions. It's not how much of your actual uh, energy needs come from electricity. It's not if you can afford it. It's not if your connection is legal. So there are lots of constraints to the data. And coming to cooking fuel, 74% of the people in 2005, six um, used um, solid cooking fuels and 53% of people were poor and used them. And that's come down to 44% of the population and 14% of people who are poor and also deprived in cooking fuel. But that's massive because that of course has time, it has energy, it has um, acute respiratory infections, eye conditions, um, all sort of wrapped up into it. And so I think that the, there is still a need to really unpack how to make clean energy a much more pervasive source um, and uh, also be able to track that. Just so that you know, if, if people are working on climate issues, obviously the, the data that I've presented is GIS located with a bit of buzzing out for anonymity. Um, but in other countries, we've been able to merge this with satellite data on different environmental conditions, whether it's precipitation, the obvious one, or wildfires, or forest loss, or cyclones, etc. cetera, um, strong uh, extreme heat, heat and temp temperature and, and precipitation events. And so it would be possible to merge these also for India and, and look at some of those interactions. That would be very interesting to do. In terms of what's missing, um, a lot is missing. So we already talked about quality and learning outcomes in terms of schooling. Um, in terms of nutrition, also looking at obesity is important. Child mortality is too low. Um, so bringing in other, whether it's health insurance, whether it's actual health functionings, absentee days, but other direct measures of health at a household level would be very, very valuable. Um, and probably the standards are a little bit too acute across the board with MPI now. So if one person has six years of schooling, that just doesn't cut it anymore in terms of employability in the labor market uh, and gender. And so should it be a woman and a man and should both of them have completed at least eight years of schooling or should all adults of working age um, have completed a minimum of schooling? So the standards are, are too low. And when it comes to uh, living standard indicators, we're only asking about improved water sources, but not are they on site. It could be 30 minutes walk away and it's still okay. If it's more than 30 minutes or more, it's not okay. But if it's 29 minutes away round trip, it's still okay by the global MPI, which is probably not good. And how about flush toilets, especially in urban areas? Um, how about um, beyond electricity? How about internet connectivity? Um, and if we just stay in these domains, uh, we could go up a lot further, think of different assets that might be important now, um, like smartphones that would have given, given learning access. Um, but then, of course, very famously, the MPI does not have data on work. And nearly every national MPI across questions on work, but they don't identify whether the respondent is in the labor force. So it wouldn't be a big ask, but uh, the NFHS does not have data that we can use. Um, and then the other dimension would be obviously something about voice and empowerment um, as being a dimension that comes up very regularly 
um, something about whether the work is safe or unsafe, not just if there is work, but maybe not so far as fully decent work, but moving in that direction, some standards for work, informality, maternity benefits, disability, et cetera. Um, and then uh, something about violence. Um, so many countries from Chile and El Salvador, um, they have violence in their MPI in Nigeria. Um, and domestic violence is quite difficult and very, very sensitive, but it is in the NFHS. Um, but there, there are also other kinds of interpersonal violence, which would be really, really vital to come in. And so those are just a few of the aspects that are often in other countries' MPIs. The national MPI for India adds two indicators, bank accounts and maternal health, that is assisted delivery at a, a facility So that with anti-prenatal care visits. So there are richer indicators in the national MPI, but there would be possibilities of doing a separate but linked MPI that was a little bit more ambitious and might cover some of these challenges we've discussed using the existing data but the real need is for data on work, voice, et cetera. Um, and these are not in the NFHS data right now. Oh, uh, I'm glad I asked. That was a, that was a really useful list. Um, things that India could add, even that other countries haven't, um, and other things to look at in the future and ask for in the future. Um, we're about out of time. I'm going to stop us there. We've kept Sabina up uh, in Europe uh, fairly late. So thank you to everybody who's joined uh, online. Thank you to Sabina and to Arvind for really stimulating presentations as always. Um, and we hope to see you again uh, here or online at the Center for Global Development. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you.